In this video, we're going to talk about the concept of convolutions. Normally convolutions, uh, the convolution of two functions produces a new function and it's introduced in terms of integrals. But I want to get through the concept of a convolution uh, without using an integral, just using a sum. And this may be related to something called the discrete convolution. Now, this non-calculus explanation is inspired by uh, this article, which I found on the web. And I encourage you to uh, go through that article. It's not very long. It has some very nice animations. And it may give a better explanation than the example I'm going to use here. So the case that I'm considering is something that is actually uh, a very uh, practical consideration uh, when you're doing engineering simulations. Uh, if you're using engineering simulations, you're going to be using a lot of computers. I mean, each computer is going to have a lot of CPUs. And if you own them, um, that's great. More likely than not, you're going to be using somebody else's computers. And so you want to know how much you're going to use because you're going to be paid for your, by your usage or for your usage. So the simulations that we're going to perform. So I'm going to use simulation and job or task interchangeably. But each simulation has four phases. And to simplify our analysis, we're just going to assume that each phase needs one hour to complete. But in each one of the phases, they're going to be using a different number of CPUs. So our little table here tells us that in the first hour or the first phase, they're going to be using two CPUs. In the second phase, they'll be using four. In the third phase, they'll be using three. And in the fourth phase, the job or simulation will make use of only one CPU. And so a common metric for billing is the CPU hours. In other words, the number of CPUs are being utilized times the time they're being utilized. So suppose that you're working on a new simulation, a new model. Maybe in that model, it's solving one of the differential equations that we've studied. And uh, you're going to launch one at noon. Maybe you need time to prepare the next job. So the, at, the next job gets submitted at 1. The next one gets submitted at 2, and then a fourth one gets submitted at 3 p.m., and then the last one is submitted at 4 p.m. And there could be many questions we'd want to know, but for now, let's just focus on what's the greatest of number of CPUs utilized at any given time? Well, this is not a very difficult problem. We could just chart out the CPU utilization of each job throughout the day. So we can kind of make a little calendar here. So we, right, again, I'm using simulation and job, meaning the same thing. So if we think about the noon hour, only one job is running and it needs two CPUs. But then the next hour it'll need four, the next hour it'll need three, and then the fourth hour it only needs one. Well the second job starts in the one o'clock hour, and again it needs the same pattern of CPUs, two, four, three, and one. And then we can go to the third job, the fourth job, and the fifth job, and enter their CPU utilization. And then I could just add up the columns. And I can see that the peak utilization occurs between 3 
and 4 p.m. and it's 10. If I wanted to know the total CPU hours utilized, I would just add up these red totals, at, which are the sum of the columns. So now getting a little bit more realistic, um, it's unlikely that you'll have only one simulation launched at uh, any one time. But maybe you launch one at noon, two at 1 p.m., four at 2 p.m., three at 3 p.m., and two simulations at 4 p.m. And again, we may want to know what is the greatest number of CPUs utilized at any given time, or what is the total number of CPU hours utilized by my job set, because maybe that's what I'm going to get a bill for. Well, I could try to construct a larger table, and it's still what I would call tractable with these numbers. But this method does not scale. What does that mean? That means if I had 10 times the number of simulations, I would need a table with 10 times the number of rows. And then, while well, theoretically possible, it's just not very tractable. So is there a better way of going about this? Yes. What we want to do is we want to think of this in a different way. In the first hour, we have one job which needs two CPUs. In the second hour, I have one job that needs four CPUs. This job has gone into the second phase. The first job is in the second phase. Other two jobs, the other two simulations, are only in the first phase, so each one of them uses two CPUs. All right, what happens in the third hour? Well, my first job is moved to the third phase, so it's using three CPUs. The other two jobs in the job, the second job set, they're in the second phase, so they're using four CPUs. And then the four jobs in this third round of jobs are in the first phase, so each one of them is using two CPUs. And then let's look in the fourth hour. In the fourth hour, my first job is in its final phase using one CPU. The second job set are in the, or is in the third phase, and they're using three CPUs. The third job set is in the second phase, so they're using four CPUs. And the new job set is in the first phase using two CPUs. So let's kind of look at that pattern, right? If I look here, I have one, three, four, two. This is in the fourth hour. So I'm looking at one, three, four, two. That's exactly the reverse of the pattern of the CPU utilization for the analysis. So let's look at it in a different way. Let's reverse the CPU load list. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take our job load, the one, two, four, three, two. I'm going to put that on a list. And in, in the zeroth hour, nothing, no job is running, right? But so what's going to happen is that we're going to see what happens in the first hour is we're going to go ahead and shift this job load list to the left. Because then what happens is that then I know that this one job that corresponds to the first job set, the one simulation, is going to be needed using two CPUs. And if I shift it in the second hour, that's equivalent to shifting this job list here another place to the left. So now I have uh, one job using four CPUs and two jobs using two CPUs. And so now 
this is getting me a little shorthand of what the utilization is, right? These would be the totals that we saw at the bottom of the first table. So I'd have four plus four equals eight CPUs utilized in the second hour. Well, to find the third hour and subsequent hours, all I need to do is continue shifting my job load list to the left. Equivalently, I could have kept the job load lift constant and shifted the CPU load to the right. Either way, there's a shift involved, and that shift continues in the same direction as each hour passes. And then to find the CPU usage, then I would just multiply down the columns, and then the products then are summed up to give me the total. So in hour three, I have 19 CPUs in use. And then in hour four, again, what did I do? I just continued shifting the bottom list to the left. And then I can see that I have, what, um, one job using one CPU, two jobs using three CPUs, four jobs using four CPUs, and three jobs using two CPUs. And so I can continue that until there are no more jobs left, right? And what does that mean? That means that this bottom list has no intersection now with the top list. So let me just fill in these for practice. So I have one times one, three, three times two gives me six, four times four gives me 16, three times two gives me another six. And that we saw before was 29. All right, here I have two times one is two, four times three is 12 and another 12 and a four. So 24, 28, that gives me a 30. Here I have one times four is four, and then I have a nine and an eight, and that will give me 21. And then things get to slow down a little bit. I have three and six, that adds up to nine. And then here I just have two. And of course, there's nothing here. So in hour zero, there's zero. In hour nine, there's zero CPU utilization because no jobs are running at that time. But now let's just fill in the rest of the ones. So I have an hour one is two. Then I go to eight, 19, 29. And this is the total 30. 21 in the sixth hour. In the seventh hour, it's a nine. In the eighth hour, it's two. So it looks like to answer our original question, when was the peak utilization? That was in the fifth hour with 30 CPUs occupied. If I wanted to know the total uh, CPU hours that I could be billed for, I'd have to add up all of the blue numbers here. So let's see if we can write out what we did uh, using some function notation. So we're going to make use of an independent variable, tau. So tau uh, is uh, the, a Greek letter for T. So this is a lowercase tau. And we're going to use F to represent the number of simulations launched at the beginning of that hour, of hour tau. And so then if I want to reverse G of T, uh, I'm going to have to subtract its input by negative T. And then um, so T, the I'm, negative, I'm sorry, negative one. I'm, I'm multiplying the negative tau 
I'm sorry, the tau by negative one. And then I'm adding the t. So now t is going to uh, represent the uh, CPUs utilized um, at a given hour t. All right, so if I uh, then multiply the number of jobs running over uh, uh, times the number of CPUs utilized uh, by the simulation, and I do that for every hour where the job is running, or up to at least hour t, uh, then I should get the number of CPUs utilized in hour t. So let's just make sure this formula works. I'm going to use tau values going from uh, 0 to 9, just like we did with our little charts before. And uh, we know that in the 0th hour, no jobs have been launched. And then in the first hour, we have one job launched, then two, then four, then three, then two. And then the we reverse this, right? Um, because uh, no, I haven't yet reversed this. This is the G load. We will reverse it. So it's two CPUs, then four CPUs, three CPUs, and one CPUs utilized by the job. All right. So um, let's go ahead and work this out then. Um, Maybe I could have got rid of having this plus one if I would have started G at one instead of zero. But at any rate, this formula does work if I go ahead and substitute those values in there to find the usage uh, when T equals six, so that's our six. Then I can go ahead and put it into my summation formula and it'll get the same numbers as I did using my table. And again, what was that? That was four, and then nine, and then eight, all right? So I get zero, zero, four, then nine, then eight, then zero from the formula. So why is the formula necessary? Well, I kind of would like to give you a demonstration here of uh, graphically, how we could picture this. So if I think of my two functions as being step functions, so if I start with my G, which again is the uh, CPU utilization by a job per hour, so the number of CPUs used. So if I just think of G of tau as two, then four, then three, then one, but I wanna reverse it just like we did with the list and so now going from left to right, it's one, then three, then four, then two. And so, uh, and then I have my uh, job load function. So I've lost, lost, launched one job in the first hour, two job in the next hour, two jobs in the next hour, and then four, then three, then one. And so the equivalent then would be multiplying of these two together. So in the you know zeroth hour, no jobs are running. And so there's no overlap. So you can think of this as we had overlapping lists before. Now we have overlapping graphs. And so then in the first hour, what I'd like to do, the yellow represents the product. The yellow represents then the number of uh, CPUs utilized by all the jobs that are running. And so in the first hour, we only had one job running and it needed two CPUs. So the yellow uh, step function goes up to two in the first hour. And then otherwise, there's no contribution from anywhere else in the graph. But now if we shift again, now I've shifted, I'm shifting this CPU utilization graph to the right, what happens? Well, in the second hour, then I have one job that needs four CPUs 
two jobs that need two CPUs. And so the aggregate then would be the product. I get this one big step that goes up to four. All right, now we've got, in the third hour, we've got three steps overlapping. So this must mean that I have um, one job needing three CPUs, two jobs needing four CPUs, and then uh, four jobs needing two CPUs, and so on. Here, I actually need four jobs needing four CPUs, so it actually goes off the chart here, off the screen. And as we continue to shift our uh, function to the, our G function, or G, the graph of the G function, to the right, then we can see the, the utilization based on the steps of the yellow lines here. And so finally, we get to the seventh hour. What's going on here? I have uh, three jobs needing one CPU, one job needing three CPUs. And then finally, in the eighth hour, I just have one job needing one CPU. And then in the ninth hour, there's no overlap. So the multiplication of these two graphs is just going to give me zero again. So the way this convolution, so now our summation, we know that if we went from having step functions to having continuous functions, our summation in a limit uh, can be written as an integral. So we have inside the integral, the product of f of tau times g of t minus tau. And we're into, so t is a constant here. Tau is a dummy variable used for the integration. And that integral is a new function, which is called the convolution of f and g. This convolution is used in many different fields. It's particularly used in uh, the analysis of signals by electrical engineers, but it's also has uh, now a, a new life or additional life, very popular life in image processing. So for example, with some primitive machine learning, it would be used for edge detecting detection. So detecting in a photograph, what are the edges of the object? So here's a nice uh, animation which I have uh, recorded. Here's the uh, original uh, website which displays it. It's a very simple uh, Python script. And so uh, it's freely available if you wanted to uh, try your own different functions. So the idea here is very similar to what we just did. We're going to have a constant valued function, which is the red. And then we're going to have this blue curve, which represents the signal that's going to be moving through there. And the green overlap represents the area under the product of the function. So the, the area under the, or the green shaded area represents the convolution. So the example is well made because all both the red function and the blue function uh, have peaks which are less than one. So when you take the product, you get a number which is even smaller. So it's easier to display. So to end the video, let's just take a peek at what happens with this. Oh, let me get over here. So the signal comes in, intersects the little step function there. And as it passes through, there's an increasing amount of area. And again, that area represents the convolution. Let's take another look. And we'll stop this recording.
And as soon as you get an intersection, then you start to get some value for the convolution.